Um, it's just not a theme. It, it's it's the actual word itself that it's found all the way through these verses uh, in John chapter uh, 14. Um, it's the popular chapter, the favorite chapter on the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, tonight's teaching, it might be contrary to some of you who have you know, learn throughout your walk, but hopefully it will straighten things out as well. Um, we got a good study tonight. Um, so the theme is abiding. Okay, uh, first of all, Jesus starts out with the command. Jesus says, and, and please keep in mind that he told them that he's going to leave the disciples. He told them they could not come. And Peter says, uh, I'll go with you even unto death. And the Lord says, uh, no, Peter, you're not going to do that. Uh, but, but he says to them, and he starts out in verse one, let not your heart be troubled. And that's a command. Uh, what is interesting is that earlier Jesus was troubled in spirit. Okay, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, and and um, the word troubled is also in Greek the word tarasso uh, for agitated means agitation. He used the same word. Uh, for the disciples but he said your heart which is the very control center of your life let not your heart be troubled now listen to this you are believing in God and here's the command believe also in me and but what I mean by a command is it's, it's not a suggestion. It's not a, an idea. It's a present imperative. In, in, in Greek studies, that means since you're believing in God, believe also in me because he's trying to tell them, you know, what, what, what's he saying? You're already believing in God. Now believe in me. You will still be believing in God. You believe in God, but now transfer that over to me because I am God in flesh. That's what he's saying. He's trying to tell them that because they, the disciples at that moment, still didn't grasp that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. So he's trying to explain that to them. So he's trying to get their attention. He's trying to get them to look at him as if they're talking to God himself because their whole lives throughout history they've been taught to worship God and here's this guy Jesus in the flesh he comes up there and he says well you know you've been believing in God now believe in me because I am God verse 2 in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. Okay, here's, here's some insight here about the word mansions, okay? The word for mansion used in the original text is the word in the Greek, monai. And if you have a Enter uh, an exegesis translation in the Greek, you're going to see the word monai. Um, it's representative in this uh, context here, and it means a dwelling place. Okay. Remember, the theme tonight is, to, uh, is about abiding. It means a dwelling place. It is actually the noun form of the word abide. 
it is an abiding place, a dwelling place. Okay. And again, he is uh, starting to make the emphasis on the key word. Uh, uh, this section, unfortunately, the word monai in Greek never refers to mansions, as we know a mansion to be. Uh, the text refers to the word as dwelling places. Now, some of us are of the understanding that Jesus is up there right now, hammering away at our condos. And I'm going to show you here what the context of the word mansion means. Um, so what am I about to introduce? I, I want to just kind of, let's put that on the back burner. As, as I take you through this chapter, I'm going to give you the statement first, and then I'm going to give you the information to back it up. And the word monai is only found here in verse 2. And and one more place in verse 23 of this chapter. Uh, this is the, these are the only two places where the word is found. In verse 23, it is sort of like a bookend. He starts out by saying, in my father's house are many dwelling places. Okay. Now in verse 23, uh, Jesus answered and said uh, uh, unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. Are you catching that? So where's the dwelling place? It's right here. Me, you. Jesus says he will come and make our abode, Monai, with him. Uh, now let's go back to verse 2. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That's where a lot of people get confused. You know, he's going up there, he's, he's, he's hammering away in all these condos. Now, uh, verse 3 uh, is the coming of the Lord. But there's a big discussion and an actual disagreement about which coming. But Jesus says in verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Okay. Um, and some people think that that's the rapture of the church. Uh, some people say it's the second coming of Christ. Uh, yours truly believes that it is the time when you receive Christ. Now, he's leaving, but he's coming back. And that's where Jesus is. We will also be also. And where is the Lord right now? He's abiding right here if you receive christ he lives in you you are that dwelling place you are that mansion the monai dwelling place verse four and whether i i go you know and the way you know now thomas saith unto him lord we know not whether you go us, and how can we know the way? And so Thomas asked the question, Lord, we know not whether you go us. We don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? Is another misconception that I'm going to clear up. And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the father but through me the way is not a direction the way is a person and that person is jesus christ i am the way 
So over the years, I've asked the Lord to give me direction, to show me what way to go, as if somehow during the break or lunchtime, he's going to send his angel down and, and the angel is going to say, uh, go down about two blocks and turn left and turn to your immediate right. And then on the third driveway on the left hand side, as if that is what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the Lord to give me direction. What do you want me to do, Lord? Well, as a biblical Christian, that's the wrong approach. We only have to do one thing, follow Christ. How do I know where that is? I go where he goes. How do I know what that is? As we'll see in a moment, his spirit dwells in me. So wherever he goes, I go. The more I trust him, and the more he, the more he takes me. Instead of looking for doors and looking for signs, uh, because, you know, Satan can do the same thing. Satan can open doors, and Satan can produce signs. My strongest point as a believer in my relationship with Christ is to confess my spiritual stupidity. Lord, I don't know. And even if I did know, I wouldn't know. And even if God did send a message, how do I know it's from God? I don't. I plead dumb sheep. You know, you know, as I explain this, I'm trying to explain with some understanding here. I plead dumb sheep. I plead, I can be deceived and I'm trusting totally in you, Lord. I say, Lord, you lead the way because I don't know where I am going on my own. And when I began to take that approach and, and that position before Christ, there was never any doubt about what the Lord wanted me to do. Everything was so definite. I did what he did. And that's all. See, we're like dumb sheep. And we go astray all the time. But the Lord has the ability to reel us back every single time. That reminds me of Psalm 23. It says, it comes to mind. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. We're just dumb sheep. He's going to do all that. And he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So what, if you have, what happens if you approach the Lord and say, well, Lord, I think I'm going to sell my home and move to Idaho. Which place do I have to move to? Or what job do you want me to take? Or, well, other than a circumstance beyond your control, who told you that you had to move to begin with? James 4.13 says, Come down, you who say, tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will go to such a, such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You know, like you see steam. Our life is like that. One second you see it and it slowly vanishes. So instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your ignorance. All such boasting is evil. 
but you know, the thing is we do that all the time. And I, I might do, I'm guilty of that too. And the Lord has to humble me and say, I didn't tell you to go there. Or I didn't tell you to do that. You see, we get ourselves into that situation. And the key word here is if the Lord wills. Okay. That's the approach that we take. Other than that, it's, it's called uh, the sin of presumption. I think I'm going to go here and I'm going to go do that and I'm going to go to college and I'm going to do this. No, you're a slave of Christ. It's what his will is. So, Lord, if it's your will, um, would I, could I go there or could I go here? Okay, but, but, but we have to ask ourselves these things. Who told you you had to move? Well, I decided I, I had to move now. So I got to seek the Lord. Uh, where? And, and for myself, I get so frustrated and confused because he doesn't answer. So how do I know where, where he wants me to move? Do I call the counselor? What do I do? Well, what is the Lord doing? Nothing. There's your answer. Who said you had to move? Who says you had to do anything? It's either because of worry or fear or anxiety or just plain old, here's what I want to do. And if it were the Lord's will that you, you do move, he will create that circumstance. If you notice in the gospel, Jesus was always putting the disciples in circumstances beyond their control. Are, we, are you guys picking up on that? He's always putting us in situations beyond our control. Because he's in control. Thank God he's in control. Because if I were in control, I'd be a train wreck every other day. He's capable of moving you to where he wants you to go. And he will reveal his will to you. But the things that are this very minute. So we ask, Lord, if it is your will, should I move and nothing happens? There's your answer. Or if it does happen, happen he will develop it. But you got to ask the Lord if it is your will. So waiting on the Lord is one of the hardest things us knuckleheads will ever encounter. Jesus tells the disciples that without me, you can do not one spiritual thing. Period. That's what he kept telling them. And so, you know, we are disciples. We are followers of Christ. And he doesn't give us directions. He is the direction. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We just have to trust our lives in his hands. And we saw in John chapter 11 that, that he raised Lazarus from the dead, that Jesus told Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection. It's not an event. It's a person. The way is not an event or an instruction for direction. It is a person because Christ lives in me and he rose from the dead. I'm going to rise from the dead too. Well, we'll see in a moment that because he is my peace also. When I experience peace, it is him. It's not a feeling. Doesn't mean tranquility. It means Christ. You know, the more we get into the word and become more specific and detailed in our rightly dividing of the word, the more we find that scripture points 
to Jesus Christ. It's all about him. It's not about us. Many teachings today in, in, are pointing in two directions, two different directions. One to Jesus and to me and one to me. 50% of it is Jesus and 50% of it is my responsibility. So I think. He told me to do this, so I have to do it. That's not biblical Christianity, my friends. He does it through me. Or it is not of him, period. No one can come to the Father, but through me, Jesus said. For those of you studying Greek text, notice perfect tense in verse 7. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. So that's the answer to Thomas's question. In verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. You know, we've been hearing about your father for three years. You think that maybe one of them had a wife or a girlfriend that said, are you are going to take me home or to introduce me to your father? I haven't seen him. I haven't met him yet. We have been listening to you talk about your father and that you speak his words, not your words, and that it is him working in you, not you. So show us the father, bring him out. In verse nine, Jesus says to him, haven't I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the Father? See, they didn't get it yet. As was evident here with Philip. They didn't understand that Christ is the Father and the Son. All in one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And back in chapter 10, verse 31, he says, and I and the Father are one. And he is leading into teachings now that are going to say, the Father and I, we are going to make our abode in you. I am in the Father and the Father in me, and we are going to be in you. We are going to be all one. Not in some mansion up in heaven. Besides, it's heaven. There's not going to be a need for private quarters. If you can imagine that. Verse 10. Do you not believe that I am the Father, I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Christ says that throughout the entire gospel. I speak not of my own accord but I speak the things that the Father is speaking through me. Oh, wait a minute here. One of the cult religions group says that Jesus can't be God because at his baptism, the Father spoke from heaven and the Spirit came down upon him in the, in the form of a dove and Jesus was standing in the water so the Father spoke from heaven. So how could Jesus be God? Well, I have another question. How could it be the Father dwelling in Jesus that does the works if the Father is up in heaven and he is talking up there and he is down here? Could it be because he is God? Jesus never came to claim to be separate from and doing his own thing. It was always, I'm doing the Father's works. I'm giving the Father's words. I did not come in my own name. I come in my Father's name. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. 
What did Jesus say? You shall know them by their fruits. I should, I shouldn't have to say anything. If I'm a Christian, God's spirit will be producing fruit as I grow in the things of Christ. Even Jesus himself said, you don't have to believe because I'm saying it. Look at the very works themselves. And then in comparison, verse 12 says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Just wanted to clear up another misconception about this greater works thing. Can we do greater works than Jesus? I don't think so. That's not what this is saying. Verily, verily, I say unto you. And again, that means establishment of a spiritual truth. Whenever he says verily twice, because verily means of a truth, of a truth. He's establishing a spiritual truth. He that believeth on me, or literally into me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my father. The term greater used here, because there's many different views as to what greater means. And a lot of people want it to mean greater works in that you will do more than what Jesus did. A lot of people think that way. In Greek studies, it's called the genitive of quantity, not the genitive of quality because there's no such thing. It's called the genitive of quantity. In other words, more greater works in the sense of there will be more of them because God is now limited and located in the person of Jesus Christ. But when Jesus Christ leaves and sends his Holy Spirit, his spirit will now indwell in all of his people. And Jesus will be working through his people, thousands of millions of them all over the world. Tentative of quantity. And he says, because I am going to the Father. Verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I attempted back in chapter 10 to identify for you what the biblical phrase in a person's name actually means. Many groups today use the Lord's name as if it's a lucky rabbit's foot or some kind of formula. They say, they say it accesses the spirit. They say that if you use Jesus' name, all of a sudden, you're unleashing the spirit. And of course, you can understand why that teaching is so popular, because it puts you in control. If you are in control of God's spirit, wow, that's pretty darn powerful. Many people see in church today, I don't know. All through my life, I've, I've heard people get up there and the worship music's going and, and somebody gets up there and says, come Holy Spirit, fill this place. Okay, that's, that, that's fine, Danny, but as if they're trying to resuscitate the Holy Spirit. Remember where the Spirit abides. The Holy Spirit's already in you. Why are you asking the Holy Spirit to come and fill this place as if you're trying to drag it down from heaven? That Spirit's already in you. You don't need to resuscitate it. And if you think you need to resuscitate the Holy Spirit, maybe you're lacking it. That's some hard teaching. But that's about as truthful as I can get. 
So when you go somewhere in somebody's name, like an ambassador, as Jesus has been introducing for us back in chapter five, in verse 43, was the first one. I am come in my father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. So first of all, he says, I'm here in my father's name, not in my own name. So in John chapter uh, 10, verse 25, Jesus answers them, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. And in chapter 12, verse 28, it says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Couple those texts with everything that we've studied. That it is not me doing it. It is the Father in me. It is not me speaking. It's the Father in me who is speaking. What does it mean to ask for something to be done in Jesus' name? Obviously, it has nothing to do with us. When I'm asking for something to be done in Jesus' name, I'm asking for it to be done for his glory. That he would manifest himself and that he would do it for his purposes. It has nothing to do with me using his name as a magic formula. In fact, we'll see in chapter 15, Jesus said, if my word abides in you and you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Why? Because you are going to be asking according to his word. That's why. You are not going to be asking him for your own thing. A lot of times when we pray, we, we're, we're trying to rub the the the. the Get the genie to come out of the bottle by our casting our prayers to God. You'd be like, oh, yeah, Lord, uh, do this and do that. Like some kind of uh, genie going to grant you some kind of wish. You know, prayer is not all about that. See, God's the alpha and the, he's the omega. He's already been in your future. He's already been in your tomorrow. So when you ask God about a situation, he's already been there. It is up to you, the one praying, to get understanding of God's will in that situation. Because he's already been there. Are you getting that? So there are people that argue and say that anything you ask, Jesus will do it. If you, if you have enough faith, and that's the man-centered gospel, there's a whole new teaching on faith, and we're not going to get in that tonight. I just got to tell you one thing, Jesus is your faith. Man cannot produce it. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. I can't produce faith, so how can I tell my brother, where's your faith, brother? Where's your faith? God's not answering you because you don't have enough faith. Well, he is the author of my faith. I have all the faith I need. Nobody lacks faith. You either have it or you don't. Period. Jesus living inside you and me is my faith. He kept telling the disciples, without me, you can do not one thing. And so it doesn't say that if Jesus meant his name to be used like that, uh, he were to make the promise that, that anything you ask in his name, he will do it. Here's the catchphrase here. There, where's the catchphrase there? Where is the conditional clause that says that he's going to do that so if i tell people that if it means a formula then go out and start doing things in the name of jesus and what happens when it doesn't happen well i didn't have enough faith whenever you hear that 
you immediately are going to know that brother doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, it doesn't say there in the Bible. It just says, I will do it. It doesn't say if you have faith. So if you think it's a formula, you just name Jesus' name and it should happen, right? I mean, don't put the blame on human performance. It doesn't mean that. It means you are like an ambassador. It is like if you are representing the United States and I don't know where you could go uh, overseas to represent the United States that if your life would not be in danger. But let's say you're an ambassador being sent to another country. You are there in the name of the United States of America and you are representing your country and your government. Now what happens if you set up shop and you just decided to start legislating and doing things the way you wanted it done. You wouldn't last very long. You are there in somebody else's name. You are there for somebody else's representation. You are there to do what the head of the government back there tells you, what they want you to do. You are an extension of the government. I'm trying to get somewhere here with all this analogy here. We represent Jesus Christ in his name. And when I go out in the name of Jesus Christ, I represent him and I pray that God would glorify his name through me. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, some of the Greek texts, instead of a command, it is the future tense. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay. That's what it is in its true context. I love studying in the Greek because it really irons out a whole lot of scriptures for me. I have a good pastor and he has a PhD in, in Greek theology and Greek studies and None of this comes from me. I, I can tell you that it, it's all come from him. It's from learning from him that I've been blessed to gain a lot of understanding through the Greek. That's why I keep quoting the Greek. The Greek was written in the original text for those of the, that are new in here. The Greek, the the scriptures. The original texts were written in the Greek because that was the known language at the time. Um, they had lost, uh, the Jews had lost their Hebrew speaking ability when they came back from their second exile of 70 years. They lost their ability to speak Hebrew. It was a new generation. They were speaking Mesopotamia by the time they left. So 70 scholars decided to break away and they went to Alexandria, Egypt to rewrite the Old Testament and they wrote it in the Greek. And it's called the Septuagint. The Septuagint means 70. The 70 scholars that got freed from the exile decided to rewrite the Old Testament. And so when the apostles got on board in, in Christ, um, in Christ's day, the known language of the time it was still Greek. So they wrote the New Testament in Greek. And so that's why we're, we have studies in Greek exegesis. Um, so some of the Greek texts instead of a command, it is the future tense. That if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Um, isn't it interesting? Everything in our relationship with Jesus Christ is based on love. I have said this in the past and I'll say it again. We make decisions based on who and what we love the most. It is just a fact. When I have to make a decision between two things, 
It's which one I prefer, which one I like, which one I love. Sometimes you have to make a decision between studying the word and going to some activity uh, I really love to do. We make decisions on who we love the most and what we love the most. Jesus says, if you love me, third class condition yet to be fulfilled. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Period. The reason why we don't obey him is because we love something or someone else more. That's usually our human nature. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. Paracletos is the word used here. It is the word for the comforter. It is also officially in Greek the name of the defense attorney. Paracletos, defense attorney. And in Greek concept, it means someone or something that comes alongside of you to help you. Jesus says he's sending us the Holy Spirit. You can imagine that if you get thrown in jail and the defense attorney came to present you, he would stand next to you before the judge and he would represent you. That's what the comforter is. I will give you another comforter, he said. And in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he is called the defense lawyer, Pericletos. If you want to know what the prosecution is, it is the word Hasatan, the Satan. That is the official word for the prosecuting attorney. Hasatan means your adversary. That's where they get that word from. The devil is our adversary. Now notice this. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. And the word another means another of the same kind. Another of the same kind as he is. As he is. He's like, the comforter is like Jesus. Notice this. In order that he may abide. And there's our word. The theme of tonight is abide with you forever. Now, how long is forever? No end. Jesus is going to send another comforter and he's going to abide in me and I'm going to be a dwelling place forever. You guys still waiting for that mansion to be built? It's already done. You're the walking mansion. Right now, he's dwelling with them on the outside in the person of Christ. He is on the outside of them. But after he goes to the Father, he is going to come and dwell on the inside. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In other words, I will not leave you comfortless. Orphanos is where we get the Greek word. <clears throat> for comfortless we get the word orphans I will not leave you as orphans he says you ever felt like an orphan as a Christian you receive Christ and it seems like you have less friends less things that you can do well the Lord says I'm not going to leave you as an orphan I'm going to come to you Look what it says. I will come to you. He is talking about his coming after his ascension. Verse 19, yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me because I, I live, ye shall live also. They still don't understand that he's getting ready to hang on a cross. Now, that's a nice promise, though. Verse 20. 
at that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. There's that aboding again. You see how he's making the connection here. Talking about those mansions. 21. He that hath my commandments and keeps them. He it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Okay. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says, For in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily or in bodily form. When I receive Christ and I am born of his spirit, I have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living inside me, period, in its fullness. I don't have a part of him or a piece of the Holy Spirit. I have the fullness of the Godhead living inside me. The full Monty. When I receive Christ, I am born in his spirit. I have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living inside me, period. Not part of him. We have to understand that we have a spirit. And we have God's spirit. Comes into our spirit. We become one, never to be undone. His spirit is in our spirit. It's like taking a teaspoon of sugar and stirring it in coffee. Make to make it sweet. You can't unsweeten it. Once the spirit dwells inside you, it cannot be undone. And when I die, and by the way, the word death means separation. But when my spirit leaves my body, he is taking me with him. His spirit and my spirit will never be separated from now throughout eternity. 22, Judah saith unto him, not a scarlet, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest us thyself to us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man loves me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode in him. He repeats that abode thing again. Verse 23. And hopefully you're understanding by now what I'm trying to point out to you that in this chapter points out that it's not a mansion up in heaven. I got to thinking about it and that it probably offends God anyways when we think that way. He's making his abode in us. 24. He that loveth me and keepeth and not keepeth not my sayings and the word which ye hear is not mine but the father's which sent me. And Jesus is giving glory to God again. 25. These things have I spoken unto you being ye, ye present with you. 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. We're getting ready to end here. 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And there he's, he's comforting them with those words again. Don't be agitated. It's interesting that Jesus said the peace that he gives is not the same peace that the world gives. And yet that's what we expect. Tranquility, calmness, no turmoil in the physical realm. That is peace. I have peace when I'm sitting out in the yard and there's no noise, no people, just the breeze. That is peace. But that's the world's peace. First of all, the word peace, irene. Its root word means unity, oneness or unity. Nothing to do with feelings or tranquility or oneness or unity. Here's how it works. Paul taught in Ephesians 2.14, and he says, Jesus Christ is our peace. And 
that has the definite article with it, Jesus Christ is the peace of us. He is our peace. What Paul is saying is that peace is a person, not a feeling or tranquility. I mean, sure, I could sit at a valley overlooking the land all by myself and think I have peace with God. But do you have the peace of God? That's when he lives inside of you. Peace of God is something external. I'm, I'm sorry, the other way around. Peace with God is something external. Peace of God is internal. So when I ask him, Lord, I need your peace. What am I praying for spiritually? Is that I become one with him, that he is with me and that I am with him. And he's there to take me through. But it has nothing to do with feelings. Jesus said, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give unto you. Interesting in the Greek text where it says, my peace, I give unto you. It is not mine. It's mine. The word mine. The peace that is mine, I give to you. Not as the world gives. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Again, taraso, agitated. Neither let it be afraid. That it is not the normal word for fear. That's the word for courage. With the alpha primitive in front of it, he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither be without courage. That's what he told Joshua when he commissioned Joshua to take Moses' place. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you wherever you go. Therefore, take courage. Twenty-eight. We have heard how I said unto you, I go away and I come again unto you. If you love me, ye would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. 29. And now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. In closing up here, verse 30 here. After I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. What a powerful chapter. Jesus is saying his love for the Father is what motivates him to keep the commandments the Father gives to him. Jesus says, if we love him, we will keep his commandments. And that's all I got, gentlemen. Let's close with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love. We thank you for this intimate relationship you have begun, that you have with us. We go so long thinking that it is more of a religious relationship where we pray up to the sky and that God would hear us. But you have made your abode, your dwelling place in us, Father, in your fullness to have this intimate relationship with us and to have us to face life with courage because you are in us. Not only have you filled us, Lord, but you have also sealed us as your position. Help us to know you and to understand this relationship that we have with you, that we too might live life with courage and love as we seek to obey you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And that's all I have, gentlemen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Walter. Uh, Mark, do you want to start the live or stop the live stream before we get into sharing?
Yeah. Sure, if he's still there. Mark, you there, brother? Was that him barking? Uh, no, no. <laughs> That's my dog. Sorry. <laughs> Everybody, you can unmute yourselves now. Yeah. I just... I can't. I can't. One of you oh. guys. <laughs> I might have to mute myself. Welcome <laughs> to early. I think Mark oh. got raptured. What oh, happened, Mark? Says, can you read on the phone? Yeah, yeah. I just I can't stop the live stream though, brother. Please, he's abiding That's somewhere. Right. That's all right, TJ. You can uh, he can edit it out. Okay, perfect. All right. So uh yeah, we'll try we'll try to there he goes. So we'll try to keep our our uh commentary or questions, opinions, whatever on point, boys, with what the message was tonight. Let's try not to stray too far off topic here. Uh I am gonna ask that we try to keep it to you know four to five minutes each, as we do have 20 people in here. So um I'll just call on some names. If you do like if it's late for you and it's getting late and you gotta run. I'd rather you share, so just put your hand up, and I'll uh, call on you. Uh, where are we start? Pastor Ted, you want to start us off, brother? <clears throat> well, it's kind of hard to follow that. Plus, no, admittedly, I wasn't here for the entire teaching, but uh, I don't really have anything else to add to that, so I'm just going to do the wisest thing I know to do and hush up. <laughs> All right, brother. All right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Ted. Uh, Yosef, I'm gonna jump in. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is usually late for me. Um, it's it's a little bit later on on um, on the East Coast. So just a quick word about about the. You guys can hear me, right? Okay, yeah, it's something. All right. So just a quick word about the Hebrew and the Greek. Um, while it is true that coming back from the exile, um, the average. Um, Hebrew at that time did not speak the, the native tongue um, in their everyday language. It, be, it did um, by probably after the, the Septuagint was written by the scholars. Um, there was a lot of debate about whether or not that should be accepted. And ultimately it did become accepted it was as if it was the same scriptures, but it was based on the Hebrew tradition that they had, the scribal tradition. Now, um, in synagogues at the time of Yeshua, at the time of Jesus, um, they had this thing called the metergamon, which is someone where the, 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 the rabbi would go up, he would read from the Hebrew, whether or not people understood it or not, and then they would interpret it in Aramaic, which was the spoken language of, of the common people. Um, now, Greek, probably people who did business with Greeks and Romans... Hold on. Probably people who did business with Greeks and Romans did um, speak speak a, a bit of Greek, and usually the scholars who knew the scriptures, um, like like I think we see that the the apostles and Yeshua himself uh, quoted from the Septuagint. But it's interesting to note that some church fathers believed that since Peter, a common a common Hebrew, you know, understood the Hebrew and understood the Aramaic and would have been preaching in those languages. And then it was later by the apostles adapted into Greek. So some church fathers who were, who were writing after John um, and taught by John, the, the, the apostles and uh, uh, the apostle John they there, they believe that the original new Testament was first relayed in Hebrew and then adapted into Greek. So I just thought that that's kind of important. Um, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. historical background there but um just what's going on with my week um you know in in relating to to what uh what walter was was talking about being led um i ran into some some hebrew israelites if you guys know what that sort of cult group is um they're very very much a hateful group um they believe that all jews today are false jews they believe that they're you know um that 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 people of color are are the real jews um you know so they 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 are very hateful towards it's almost like this reverse racism sort of thing going on i'm not going to mischaracterize all of those groups as hateful but particularly the ones that come preaching on the streets 
um, because I do know some who are former Israelites and I do know some who are who are not of that hateful type. But the but the, their theology as a group are very hateful. And so, um, you know, I ran into these guys and, you know, I know that God brought me to these people um, because I, I've been. Uh, I've been taking some 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 pointers from my friends who were former Israelites on how to interact with these people, and you know it was in my heart that that I would bump into these people, and I ended up doing so. I didn't even know that they were around here because I used to bump into them down in Boston, and when I moved, I haven't seen them since. So the thing is, um, you know, I just didn't know whether I should interact with them or not, and then on top of that. I started arguing with them. And on top of that, the Mormons showed up. So I got, I'm arguing with, with the Israelites. I'm arguing with the Mormons. And, and then, so it was just like, okay, so God did bring me there, but did he bring me there to, to, to argue with these people? Right. And so it, it, it was, so sometimes God, I don't think that, that God is necessarily saying, He's trying to determine your every action. He's not trying to say, well, like there's a right decision every time you do something. He's saying, look, if you're following my way, you're going to do things the way that I teach you how to do things. Now, if you don't want to go and interact with the Israelites, then don't go and interact with the Israelites. If I wanted to stay home, I could have stayed home and that would have been fine too. You know what I mean? I don't think that God mm -hmm. is out like laying out our entire life's decisions, but I do think that he's teaching us the way that he wants us to live in every situation that we, that we have. So, um, and, and the last thing is, um, the last thing is I, 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 I've been looking into like the whole thing about the mansions, like, like, cause I've always looked like going back to the languages, I would read, read my Bible and be like, wait a minute. In my father's house are many mansions. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. How could a house be in a, in a, in a mansion? Or how could a mansion be in a house? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. So, so the, way that, the way that I look at it is the Old Testament doesn't say very much about uh, a best Messiah dying so that we can go to heaven, right? It doesn't say very much. There is a concept, an idea of being gathered to your, to your, to your father's. Which, which does have spiritual um, emphasis. But at the same time, the focus was more about God coming to us, coming near to us and us drawing near to God and abiding, right? So that's, that was the whole thing of like God's presence abiding in the tabernacle, us bringing our sacrifice and abiding with God, that sort of idea. It wasn't so much of us going like, like the Babel, building a tower to heaven, that sort of thing, trying to go to heaven. And, and I think like, you know, the way that the gospel is taught to people often is more like that is more like, let's, let's, we have to go somewhere else when God is just as, is, is closer than we think. And that, I, that I think is the whole point. I don't even think heaven is up there. Um, heaven is another dimension because, you know, the heavens are where the rain comes from Shemayim, but it's, you know, God, it's a it's a created place too and i'll leave it there heaven is a created place god created heaven so naturally wherever god is it's not even wherever god is god, god is just in, in god's space it's just we don't even understand that because god created heaven so thank you brother. and i think the dog agrees <laughs> uh, brother todd you want to jump in Except Jesus. That's it. Being, uh, being, you know, kind of in, in the going through this uh, uh, the, for the first time is kind of interesting. Is <clears throat> you talk about the Lord abiding in you and to receive the Holy Spirit to live within your soul, to be, be part of your body daily, um, and then to be able to listen to that, um, that, that voice that's riding inside of you has always been. Um, not only key to me, but also a challenge to me also. But um, the, there's always a challenge in here. Um, when I was looking at a couple spots, <clears throat> it says, and, and I'm reading from the, from the NLT version, but it says, if you, if, if you had really known me, and whenever I see a, a conditional statement like if, 
that 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 really shakes me a little bit because um, it bothers me to know that we can we can be so worldly all the time, knowing that there's a there's you know he knows he knows that we're going to be challenged. He knows that um, we're out there to to be together um, with one. But he, he always says that, you know, it's always a challenge. You know, if I step back a little bit, it says, you know, it's from, it's from Thomas. It says, no, we don't know, Lord. Um, we have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? And that's where his conditional statement comes back. And he says, well, if you had really known me. And that, that's a challenge to me because it's a, if, uh, daily. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like true. But, you know, what's, what blocks what blocks my um my daily interaction with him and it's anything that distracts me away from the word and it's and it's a challenge it's a challenge for me but i do know that he abides me and he lives you know lives within me so um you know and there's another statement here a little bit further down uh, on chapter on uh, chapter 15 but uh, verse 15 says if you love me and that's again another challenge if you love me yeah. you're going to obey my commandments and i will ask the father and he will give you uh, another at the other advocate another advocate and that would be the holy spirit so um you know i want to believe that uh i love the lord with all my heart that he that the advocate and uh abides in me and um you know and that he will never leave me and, I, and that's that that is a comfort me comfort for me so um but i pre appreciate the the invite can, tonight. I, can, I really I add living this. can i add something to that what you just said I mean, you know, um, and I hear what you're saying, and and I I believe that the it's a present imperative to where the word if is actually the word since mm -hmm. used in that context. Since, because he's already saying, "Haven't I been with you all this time?" and yet. You do not believe me. So he pretty much saying since you, I mean, and, and, and I can do some more research, but I'm pretty sure that the word if used there in that context is actually translated to since. Since you've Thank heard you. me, at, at least believe in the works is what he's trying right. to tell them. That, that, that's a good, that's a good point. So yeah, it, I, it, those studying the Greek, I think that word is translated as since. I mean, the English really hacked up scripture. I'm telling you, they really did. So that's what I got tonight. All right, thank you. Thank you, Brother Todd. Thanks for coming. It's a blessing to have you with us, brother. Uh, let's see who we got here. Uh, Brad, you want to go, brother? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, man, good job, Walter. I, I picked up a lot of insight from your teaching tonight, man. Um, a lot of things that struck a light bulb in my head. <laughs> um, one thing that I really like that Jesus said in this verse is that if you love me, you will do my family. So that right there is like, you know, it's not, oh, you can do my commandments or if you do this, then my commandments will be okay. It's like, no, do my commandments. It's almost like to me, do my commandments to receive me. You know, so, and here, here's actually an interesting verse I was reading the other day uh, in Psalms 139. And it's probably one of the, be the best Psalms that I've ever read in the book of Psalms. So, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearful and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden. When I was made in secret and skillfully brought in the lowest part of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being unformed. And then this part right here. And in your book, they all were written. That, that right there in the book, so 
um, what I understood that, you know, that scripture I just read in, and in your book, they all were written before we were even conceived out of our mother's womb. Our life was already planned by God, you know, yeah. and, and, and it, it's that when I read that, that struck me. I was like, wow. Okay. So before God already knew, he already had our lives already planned out before even conceived. And all we have to do is receive Christ, follow his word, follow his commandments. And, you know, it's not according to what we want to do. It's according to what God wants to do. And, and I, I, you know, I've been really, I've been really understanding lately in God's word. That, you know, the more and more that we try to do what we want to do. I mean, this, it may not seem like it to you guys, but to me, it's like, it doesn't really ever work that way, you know, and it, it's, and if, and if you really pay attention to the scripture from what I get is that God wants you to do things according to what he wants, not, not for what we want, you know, right. and, um, and I, I've noticed that, honestly, that was a problem with, you know, with my ex in the past, like, it, it was all, well, this is what I think I should do, or th this is my opinion, but the thing of it is, it's not about our opinion or about being wise in our eyes. I mean, scripture even said, do not be wise, in, you know, for yourself. It's, it's about following what God wants. So Jesus said, if you love me, I will, I, you know, you will, you will follow my commandments. I mean, that speaks volumes. And all you have to do, Jesus has given you, you know, the commandments. He's given you life. He is the life. He is the truth. He is the way. And if you follow him, you know, he will plan, he, you will live your life according to how he has a plan before you even conceive. So, like, so yeah, that's why I wanted to put that scripture in there with, with what we learned. I thought that was fascinating, but uh, yeah, great job, Walter. Um, that, that was you. awesome. Um, you know, I just wanted, yeah. just wanted to piggyback on that, what you said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. That's why I use the, the sweetener and the coffee analogy if you put sweetener in your coffee, it will taste sweet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like see, there's, there's no way around it. Yes. You, can, you can't unsweeten it. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there, there is no like, oh, maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll do that. And it, it's like, it, it, you want to know what's weird is there's, there's, there's quite a few people that think that way. It's like, it's like you can pick and choose what you want to do, but the word of God is not like that. It, it, it's, yeah. it's really not like that you know See, the, nat so, the, nat the natural man doesn't want to follow god okay they, he's at enmity with god the flesh is at enmity with god but with god's spirit in us he will draw you to the father see it has nothing to do with us yeah absolutely um one of the biggest things too that i've got i'll, I'll leave it at this is if you want to hear, if you want the word of God, then you have to want conviction. If you want the word of God, you have to want conviction because the word of God convicts you. And I think that's what, you know, a lot of people are like, yeah, I want the word of God. I want it. But then when it convicts you, it's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's so huge. And it's like, man, I don't want to follow my ways. I, I, I want to, because. A person that's not saved is a person that goes their own way. And, like, I, I don't want that. I, I don't want to follow God's way. Cause his way, we don't know his, his way is much better than ours. All we got to do is follow Christ. He already has the way for every one of our lives. Already right. planned. We just got to follow his way. I'll leave it at that. Thank, thanks. Amen, brother. Uh, Nick, you want to jump in? The man with many names. <laughs> Jump in, brother. You're on mute. Yeah, you gotta unmute. All righty then. We'll circle back to you. Uh, Ramon, you want to jump in, brother? Yeah, 
Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, when I was studying this a little bit earlier, what baffles me about the Word of God is his this, I, it, what, what trips me out is uh, no matter how many miracles Jesus Christ does around his disciples, they still question him. Um, <laughs> when Thomas spoke up, I'm just like, wait a minute, why are you even questioning Jesus Christ? <laughs> and uh, this is a part where I like where Jesus put his foot down. You're frozen. And, um, letting people know, like, um, oh, you're good. can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. This is uh, it's important to me to, um, for me as a believer to, you know, everyone wants to do things a certain way, you know, and, uh, what Jesus talks about in the scripture is like, there's no other way besides he almost said like, it's either my way or the highway because he's the only one that is actually, he's to me, he is, he's the only channel to, to the Holy spirit, which is connected to God. And so like how brother Walter saying as a human flesh, and that's really powerful because he always has to remind people who he is. And, it, it goes to show how humble of a man Jesus Christ actually was before he died on the cross. You know, like, he doesn't have to prove himself to anyone. He knows who he is. He knows he is, he is, uh, he is a Holy Spirit. He is God in, in, in flesh form. And, and what I like is he understands how people work. He knows that people are not human. He People that are not perfect. And I just love how Jesus Christ, before he died on the cross for us, that he continues, he always continued to let people know almost like what's right and wrong. And, and, and I like how he's like, he's, uh, he puts his foot down and lets people know, like, if you serve me, if you, if you trust in me, you will have a spot in heaven. And, uh, I, I like that. I like that because, um, um, I was studying and uh, what I like to do is I have, I have, a when I read something, it's a little tough for me. So what I do is before we we um we have these um these gatherings with all us men, what I'll do is I'll I'll watch it. I'll go like John chapter fourteen. I'll watch it with some. I'll watch like someone speak about it. I want to hear someone else's interpretation. And I'll usually listen to the ones that are like five ten minutes because there's some people that are do like fifty minutes. That's a little bit too much for me. Um. And then what I'll do is I'll actually listen to the King James version, um, the actual scripture. And um, I like hearing it from uh, other people's perspective, just like I love this part at the end where people give me their perspective. And, um, and um, it, it helps me understand it more because I'm not, I'm more of a, I like to hear things better than, than see things. And uh, I, I just love, what I love about Jesus Christ is um, he's a, he's a, he was a fair man, but he was also a firm man. And um, I did like how he said, look, if you follow me and you trusted me, you will have a spot in heaven. And I just like, I just like that. I just like that. It, 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 it was a matter of fact. It was certainty. There was, and that moment he was not playing around. It was very certainty. So I just, I just, I just like, um, I always like, you no know, I always like going over the New Testament because I always like hearing Jesus speak, because um, it's never it's never about him, you know. Like people, we we do this one thing in sales. So I have this thing in sales. Um, uh, you know, I'm a salesperson, and um, we try to eliminate the word I. You know, I can go through a whole sales presentation and saying the word I because people when when if I'm selling something. They're not there for me. They're there for the product or service I'm providing them. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus never talks about himself. He's always speaking through the word of God. And I like that because he's, he's, he's a very humble person. And uh, that's something that I think what the scripture brought to me is I, um, I'm not a, I, I wasn't a very humble person, you know. Um, and so now I understand what it's like to be humble. Through, through the power of, of um, this hunger that I have for the Lord, like, I finally calmed down. 
Like I did it and I finally calmed down. And that's what I love about the scripture is it showed me how to be a humble man. And I am a true believer in God. And, and I, I am a true believer in the Holy spirit and things are happening in my life right now, coincidentally in a positive manner. And, uh, uh, and I know it's from these teachings that we're learning every single day. And I just appreciate you guys' time. I just, I just feel like uh, um, there's nothing more. I think there's nothing better to me um, in a man than a humble man. Because no one likes a cocky man. You know, no one likes a cocky man. And um, I just love how Jesus continues to show me um, what a true man should be. You know, so that's all I got, guys. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Brother. Right on. Okay, so I think we got Nick back here. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, thank you, Walter, for your teaching. Um, really hit home for me tonight. Um, something that really stands out to, to me personally, you know, because this is all about our per personal relationship with Christ. So I can tell you guys how it hits me personally, but I can't tell you that it's going to hit you the same way personally. But to me, this relationship with Christ is strictly spiritual. And where we get it mixed up a lot, where I always got it mixed up a lot, I'm, I'm not going to say we, I'm going to say where I got it mixed up a lot, was I couldn't figure out why my flesh tends to do what my flesh tends to do. And Paul talks about that in, in Romans chapter 7, you know, specifically. Right. But it, this is a spiritual walk, and our spirit and our flesh Yes, our spirit lives, the Holy Spirit lives in our flesh, but the Holy Spirit is God's spirit, not my spirit. Okay, that's, it's Jesus Christ. So it's Jesus Christ works through me doing any good thing. He's the one, he's the voice in the back of my head telling me, Nick, no, that is not the right thing to do. And he's the one making me second guess myself every step I take every day in the flesh. So I think there's, we're humans and I know I shared some stuff in the in the study in the chat room about reading the Bible backwards. It's just because I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to make a point that we're humans. We're already backwards. We're born backwards, man. So what's to say that we're not looking at this the wrong way? You know, it still leads back to the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ, and it still leads back to being with in the eternal presence of God. So the Bible. There's no direction in the presence of God. It's just yeah. you're in the presence of God. And we got to we got to think about this every day as, you know, the devil wants to accuse us and wants us to blame ourselves and make us feel down about ourselves and make us feel depressed and all this. He wants to do that to me every day. I'm, I'm guilty of, of falling victim to that because I'm not walking in the spirit. The spirit never leaves you, never forsakes you. And the spirit is going to heaven. Your fleshly body is going to be destroyed with the earth and created. Maybe I don't know what's going to happen, but the Bible says you're going to get a new body and you're going to and you're going to it's going to be joined with your spirit. and You're going to be caught up in the clouds with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it says. So don't think that this flesh is ever going to be pure and you're going to be Mr. Righteous, because when you start thinking like that, it's when you're going back to yourself. And I do it every day and you're not walking in the spirit when you're doing that. And it's all about it's a spiritual whole you got to see things through spiritual eyes. And if we don't see it through spiritual eyes, um, we'll fall victim and right back into sin. And that's where the devil wants us. The only weapon that the enemy has against us as a saved believer, once we're saved and once we receive the Holy Spirit, that's the definition of salvation. Once we're saved, we are now walking in the Holy Spirit. The only, the only uh, weapon that Satan has against us is to occupy the attention of our mind, a distraction, a woman with a big, a big booty, excuse my language, Whatever that is, the distraction that God wants. I mean, that uh, the, the enemy wants to distract us from God. So it's just that's just an example, but it's a good one because we're all guilty of that. And if you're not, you're not, you're not a man. So that's specific to us men. But anyways, that's all I got, and I appreciate the study, Walter. Um, look forward to studying more with you guys. Thanks, brother. Thank you, brother. Uh, Brother Peter. Wow, well, thank you so much. Um, what I got out of this is that uh, um, re receiving the Holy Spirit is like a, a circumcision of the heart. 
you know, and in uh, receiving Christ and, and having him soften our hearts and, and uh, massaging it to, from stone into a heart where uh, the Holy Spirit can live. Um, right. Uh, and, and the thing is, it, it, what I also got from it was that in verse number 28, where he says, for my father is greater than I. And I, you know, for all these years, I'm thinking, okay, the Trinity, um, they're all God. But what hit me was that when he said that is that it's because he, he put himself beneath God the Father is because he was in the flesh. Right. He came here in the flesh. And he was confirming that God was greater than he because he was here with us. And that he will ascend to the Father. And then they both will come as Holy Spirit into our hearts. You know, where it's circumcised. And now, now we walk with him. He walks with us. So, and, and that's all, that's all I got. It's it, just, just clarifying why he said that God is, like that the father was greater than yeah. him. Well, you know, brother, uh, Jesus, although he was God in the flesh, but he assumed the position of son so yes. that he can minister to us at our level in yes. the flesh. He became flesh. So he can minister to us in our flesh. But even though he didn't sin. But the scripture says that no man goes to the father except through the son. Man. Uh, and uh, thanks again, Walt, man. He, he, he brought some good insight into uh, this part of the Bible. Yeah. Thanks again. I know. I'm really. Thanks for sharing. Come on, Mark. I see you sitting there. Let's let's hear it. <laughs> you know, I I just love how you were you really focused and honed in on Dad was how we see a lot of pastors preaching on, hey man, you got a mansion and we're gonna have all these rooms and, and it's funny I had somebody recently said, yeah, you know, my mom passed away and I'm not bagging on that person. My mom passed away, but it's okay. But because I had a vision that she had her own mansion with horses. And I'm thinking like, okay, what do we, what, what else? You see a Mustang in the garage? My point, my, my, my point is, is we, we I, I can see that if I were to read this word the way it is, I would see it just like my friend did. You know, that makes me feel good. And not just that, but when you're reading it and translating it within the culture of today, that's what you're going to get. But when, like you said about the being translated from the Greek, when we see the spirit that it was created by in the translation, and we see that it's a dwelling dwelling place, but him dwelling inside us. And it, it's a whole different, it's a whole different level as you were talking about that when it says, you know, in my father's house, there are many rooms or dwellings. I love that. Manai was the word. Yeah, and um, it's it's cool too because you hit on that too where it hits in I think uh, John fifteen it says if you love me you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and He will give you another Helper so we see this another of the same kind another of the same kind like Uncle yeah. Pete was saying he was talking about about jesus being there and it's a trip though man like i'm not trying to be me but they spent three years with him three years okay i know they were fishermen but like jesus look at him you how long have you been been with me and you don't know who i am it's interesting i mean three years all the prophecies that were being fulfilled as they were walking with him for the past three years i don't know i that's just unbelievable i was talking to my wife about that. I was like, how did they not know? And then my, you know, my wife said, Tori goes, well, it shows that God will use anybody and he used the lowly. And 
Think about it. The Pharisees knew. That's why they wanted to kill him. Because they knew. <laughs> you know, with the disciples all hanging around. Hey man, this is a, this is very this is awesome. I gotta follow this guy. But anyways, that was great, Dad. Thanks. Thanks, Billy. Hey, uh, hey Mark, do, do you really think the Pharisees knew, or were they like? Really Why do you think they wanted to kill him? He was claiming to be one with God. He was claiming to be God. Yeah, I I I, I thought they really didn't believe. What him. about Nicodemus? Well, N Nicodemus definitely did believe. Him. <laughs> he, 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 he was, he was, he was the one out of a lot of them, but his heart was still troubled because Nicodemus, when Jesus said, "Yeah, go ahead." Nicodemus was convicted, but Christ still said, "You got to be born again, dude." <laughs> and he didn't, yeah, exactly. he didn't get it. Yeah. Okay, See, I, want a quick I, note about. I, I didn't think that he that the Pharisees understood him or believed him. And the reason being I thought that is because they didn't think that the Messiah would come down as a human form. That that's why I think Yeah, so. they mis they misunderstood uh Jesus as the Messiah. They they wanted to kill him because of blasphemy. Yep. yep. Him claiming himself as God. And you know, here Jesus is he's He's running around with uneducated people, and the Pharisees were the educated. Yep. And yeah. uh, they knew here, but not here. Big difference. Ah, uh, okay. And remember, they see he goes well, and they said they wanted a. They were, they basically asked him who his father was, and he goes, "If you've seen me, you've seen the father." They're like, "Wait, what? What the heck?" He's claiming and then he disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. Where he said. I would ask, is there anything in the, in the scriptures that forbids anyone from claiming deity if they really are deity? You get what, you get what I'm saying? So is there, is there anything in the scriptures that would make them think, well, we got to kill this guy because he's claiming to be deity? Because the scriptures right. clearly forget, forbid anyone from doing that. Correct. Yeah. 100%. And, and, and then, like I said, Brett, it gets better, guys. Yeah. After Jesus returns, which we're coming up. Yeah. Because uh, they were they were trained that there's no other god besides Jehovah. So here comes and Jesus. There you go, man. Sinner gospel. And another thing, they knew uh -huh. Jesus that he was the son of Joseph, the carpenter. Yes, the, the prophet is not welcome in his own hometown. Well, they thought he was a momzer, which is a, a bastard son that they would use the term momzer, uh, yeah. and that was someone who was who was uh, yep. carrot. That, that, that was someone who was cut off from their people, mm -hmm. Carrot. Yeah. Um, but real quick, I, I know we have to go to the next person, but real quick about the Trinity. Um, I've been studying something really interest, interesting about that. A lot of the terms that the church fathers use come from the Septuagint, like, uh, you know, like the terms that we know that the church fathers use. I'm not going to go into it. But there's also some mathematicians who, who say that they can actually explain the Trinity, Trinitarian theology, through mathematics and it's really not that far off but i but i personally believe that yeshua explains it relationally not mathematically it's not meant to be understood mathematically although that concept is not really foreign to mathematics like complex mathematics um uh, there is a way to understand it that way so i just thought that was interesting cool. okay so let's see. I think we just have uh, Bo and Mr. K. So Mr. K, you want to jump in? Uh, good thing. Uh, hear me a lot. Uh, yeah, you're a little quiet, but we can hear you. Oh, here. Let me turn off my uh, headphones. One minute. All right, can me better? Oh, yeah. There we go. I'm sorry. Yeah, we can hear you good, bro. Okay. Um, so basically for me, I'm still just a baby Christian. You know, I just recently got saved. So um, yeah, tonight's lesson was really good. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, tonight's lesson was really good. It just shows you that, you know, God can humble anyone, you know. And with me being a uh, former radical, you know, 
he basically, you know, he humbled me. You know, there are things that I didn't want to do in life. And then God was like, we'll see about that. So, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah. So basically, um, the, the part with the mansions in heaven. Um, yeah, that's that. That's, you know, that's one that threw me off as well. But uh, I, what I'm trying to say here, I just think that's like the dwelling place, like the Bible describes. Yeah, but um, but yeah, pretty much, man. Um, but like I say, you know, the word it's good, you know. Uh, God, you know, He leads us like you know the insurance, like how a uh, you know, the officers would lead the um troops, the legion, you know, and that's just how we gotta be with the word, you know. Yep. I'm really. And um, thanks for coming, man. Uh, every Wednesday night. If you want to join, there's also a messenger chat, brother, that I can link you up with Mark and he can get you into if you're interested. So uh, we'll just all connect after if you're wanting to. Um, okay, so we have Bo, I think. Hey, guys. I hope uh, thanks for having me. Um, it was a great lesson there. Um, I'm just a, really a spectator. I'm not, not really too much of a talker. So um, just thanks a lot Super. again. No problem. Thanks for coming. Brother. See you, Sorry, uh, was everyone able to hear me? Yeah, yeah, we heard you better. Okay, okay gotcha. Sorry about that. My uh, volume was down. No Love problem. the accent, man. Yeah, we heard you better. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I guess that just leaves me then. Hey, fellas. So something that really stuck out to me was something that uh, some of the brothers had mentioned was, you know, um, about... Uh, where is it, Philip, I think it was, um, you know what I mean, asking for more evidence, you know, and that really kind of made me laugh, too, because considering all the things that Jesus had done, done already, uh, as far as miracles and fulfilling prophecies, and now, if we jump into verse 29, it, it says here, and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe, and you know, that's the whole purpose of the prophecies in the Bible is that so that when they come to pass that we can believe that God is God. You know what I mean? They, they confirm that God is God because these prophecies in the Old Testament were done, you know, hundreds of hundreds of years before. And uh, we can actually see Jesus fulfilling prophecies, you know, pretty much as soon as he's born, he starts doing this. Oh, sorry, my battery's dying. Um and yeah, like Walter was telling, uh, talking about, you know, doing it on God's will and not our own, you know, that's a thing that I kind of struggle with too. Um, you know, I, I, I like to jump into things and not really, you know, even think them through just in my own life. So it's something that I've been struggling with is to just be patient. And as the Bible says, be still and know that he is God. So something that I can testify to that is, um, uh, the people are selling the place that we're living in right now. So I had to, you know, find a new place to live for me and my family. So I was like jumping into it right away and just, you know, looking all over for places and going and looking at these places. And some of them were, you know, really good, but pretty high priced. And uh, hold on a sec here. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I was looking at like these places and some of them were, you know, a little bit high for us in our budget so but they were perfect for us and I was trying to rush into them and God just you know put me in my place and said hey stop I got something better okay. and when I stopped trying to push my way of my will and I just took took a step back you know God blessed us with a place that we can rent to own now and it's a big house perfect for us and then you know the blessings have just rolled in now that I'm just sitting back and letting him run the show you know my dad gave us a van for free completely free put brand new tires on it all this stuff he's he bought us while well, he, he's giving us like a fridge a stove washer dryer dishwasher all this stuff you know what i mean so when we just stop trying to do things our way and just let god have his way and we're obedient to him those blessings man they just come rolling in so i like i encourage you guys to just stop take a breath and just, you know, wait for God to show you direction because his way is always better than our way. So that's kind of what I got out of it tonight. And uh, yeah, that's what I got. Amen. TJ, thank you. 
This is good. Appreciate that. Did we catch everybody? I think I think we did. I'm just kind of looking through here. I'm pretty I sure so. I called on everybody here. We're going to be in Genesis. What is it? I think 30 and 29. 31. Yeah, 30 and 31, right? Yeah. Yeah, next week. So let's get, get to reading and spending time with the Lord on that. Um, anybody have any more questions for my dad or any questions at all? Prayers. Anybody need prayers? Prayers, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just pray that um, if I bump into those guys again, that I'd be, uh, because sometimes a few of them, not, not all of them, a few of them can can, can turn violent. Um, cool. So I just, you know, some of them are former gang members, that type of thing, that type of deal. So they're, they're pretty radical. Um, so I just, just pray that I don't provoke them. You know that I don't try to start a scene or anything like that. Just, uh, just because they, they, they are very, they get in your face. So, like they, they try to provoke you is what they do. Just don't be is, is anyone familiar with who they are? No, unfortunately not. Yeah. You've never heard of, You've never heard of these guys. No. Yeah. Really? If, you, if you look up Volcat Malone. And you look up uh, some of these apologists that that deal with these people. You'll 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 see what they're about. They, you know, they they get they get pretty crazy. Um, so they, they, they yeah they 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 basically their whole theology is they try to make white people slaves. I'm I'm not joking about this. This is this is their theology. Are you talking about the Hebrew Israelites? Talking about the Hebrew Israelites. Yeah, they 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 started in Harlem back in like the 70s 80s. Yeah, I heard those guys. Yeah, it almost seems like a uh, op the opposite of the KKK almost. Yeah, I understand what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it, they, they try to reverse the whole thing. Wow. That's that's good that's... The, they're called the Black Hebrew Israelites, um, but they but they on, on wow. Sabbath, usually they choose the Sabbath on Saturdays to go out and start preaching this message that, you know, that they're the true Jews and that white people are going to be slaves. Wow. That's crazy. Well, we are slaves to Christ. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. <laughs> We're already slaves. That's, that's a good one to use. Yeah, yeah. we are. That's a good one to use. <laughs> the good kind of slice. <laughs> yeah. Whose yeah. slave are you? I'm a slave. Yeah, to I Christ. told them. I told them they're 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 a slave. They're a slave to their hatred. That's what I told them. Correct. One hundred percent. That'll start a fight. Yeah. <laughs> you, you might want to start carrying a football helmet around with your brother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if not, what you could do is you can pick Ramon up with you. Nobody will mess with you walking with Ramon and. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, hey! Do, do it. You know, Jesus said. You know, this is what Jesus said. He said, if a person strike you on the cheek, you, you give him the other. But after that, there's no more instructions. Nope. That yep. means go lay the holy hands on him. I'm playing. <laughs> that, that, that means I can show them the other cheeks down below if, uh, you know. <laughs> As you're running, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll jump in and pray for you, brother. Awesome. Uh, brother, yeah. we pray for protection over brother joseph let yes. your will be done in situations lord i ask that when he comes into those situations that you just embrace him with the holy spirit lord so that he may know your will in that situation and that it may be your truths that come from his mouth i also pray over these men that he is approaching that you soften their hearts lord yes. and i pray protection over joseph so that these men will not cause him harm let your will be done over the situation in the name of jesus amen Amen. Thank you. Claim, claim, well, song. Early tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Although I walk through the fat valley of shadow and death, I will fear no evil. <laughs> Yo, so I, I love eat. your picture, by the way. Yeah, me too. I've been staring at it. I, I have to tell you, <laughs> Joseph, don't, don't fight it, brother. Just, just go for it, man. That's my, don't that's my, fight that's it. My, uh, that's my uh, fryer. That's like the fryer's uh, haircut. I know you like that. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you got to get that sometime, man.
I, I oh, shaved my awesome. head bald not too long ago. <laughs> I was thinking about it, but I don't know if it matches my face, though. I don't know. Uh, if it, you would look good, bro. You would look good. Yeah. Uh, you got, you got a good it. head. Maybe I'll try it. Hey, man, it'll grow back if not. Yeah. Yeah. I did once when I was drunk, but it did, it did that. That was all patchy. And so maybe this time will come out better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, mine's finally coming back. I missed it. Not going to lie. Yeah, my main had back. Had yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. My little brother, he's five years now. And he's been going bald since like he was maybe 24, 22. Yeah. yeah. 25 is when I started. Like, yeah. He's always mad at me, man. They always wear <laughs> caps and stuff, and I just run through my hair. Oh, is it brother? <laughs> Yeah, he's so, so you're not brother, going yeah. bald. You're just you're just taller than your hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least Check I'm this out, bald, guys. At least I'm not a bald faced liar. <laughs> that that's me, dude. <laughs> yeah, Mark, Mark, you need to keep your hair. That's not a good look hey, for you, bald. I look like the guy from Elf the good look at all, brother. Yeah. Hey, you start going bald, brother. Hey, you better get some But look, I kept the hair on the sides, though. Look, I kept the hair on the sides. <laughs> no, hey, look like Dr. Evil. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> he don't got a four head, he got a five head. Yeah. Oh Lord. You guys are awesome. All right. Well, hey, um, we'll see you guys all next week. And um, this is awesome. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. God bless you all. Good night, guys. God bless you all. God bless you all. All right, say it you, Todd. I guess I gotta end guys, I appreciate everybody. It. God bless, guys. Love y'all. See you next Wednesday.